2017, baby. I like party like it's 2017, and I was two years younger. That was those, that was a good year for you. Remember that when you were still mobile and uh, <laughs> so, you were <laughs> that's, that's messed up. Anyway, <laughs> hi everybody. <laughs> Welcome back to uh, our prancing through the decade. Today we're going to be talking about 2017, as we have said, and we'll be, <laughs> we'll be doing that. Uh, taking a look at four different talking points here. We're going to start with some of the games from the year, some of the best games. Talk about those. Then we will try to highlight a couple of trends we spotted in this year. Then a couple of our picks uh, from the year, some great games we played. And we'll end up with your picks, your you pointing out games you really liked, trends you spotted, whatever you want. We'll have a little chat in the comments. Uh, so, anything else you want to point out before we take a look at what... Nope, we're glad you're all here. Let's get started. It's Friday. Let's do it. <laughs> all right. Uh, all right. Well, it's you can't ignore the fact Gloomhaven came out in 2017 the for G sure. G-word. What? What? Gloomhaven. I am Gloomhaven. Um, yeah, this was a Kickstarter which had gotten some buzz for sure. Sure. Uh, the previous game of, of his, uh, Forge War, did not do that well mm -hmm. and I remember we were at Essen and Paul Grogan w walked by with a box remember he came by and showed it this to us <sighs> okay and we were like what? this okay. thing is humongous and I was excited about it just because of the size right which is kind of funny because in two years I've changed my mind drastically on, on, on the that size idea. thing yeah. someone brings a big box now I'm like I don't know. Well, there is a reason for that. This game did well, and you'll notice it's ranked number one, so this is the highest. It stayed number one. It did not reach number one in 2017, I don't think. I think it was 2018, but, but it's, it's still, still there. up there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there is uh, even a, a follow up to this coming at some point. Sure. TI4 came out this year, was a sequel to Twilight Imperium. I'm actually, I did not realize this had got up to number six. That's pretty high. Yeah. Gaia Project was a follow up to Terra. Terra. Mystica? Right? Mystica. It's a reworking, like a sci fi reworking of it, kind of, right? Yeah. Spirit Island's an interesting one because this one has had a long tail of positive buzz. When it first mm -hmm. came out, it didn't get that much buzz. I mean, it got some. It's just consistently doing well to it again, where I'm looking here and going, wow, it's 13? I know. That's no small feat for a fairly complicated cooperative game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did not realize this was rated that highly. I knew it was a well-liked game, because most people speak of it highly, but wow, 13. That's unbelievable. Yeah, super high. Seventh Continent was... If I'm remembering correctly, this was almost a 2018 game because mm -hmm. it came out near the end. Uh, big storytelling game. This was a big, two big games back to back came out. Pandemic Legacy Season 2. The critically acclaimed and yet not nearly as financially successful as the first one. Right. Mostly because it was called Season 2, so therefore you went into it thinking you had to play Season 1. Which, which you probably should. Which, which would have helped, but... Um Sure, and that's usually the way this works, right? I, I still do say that Pandemic Season 2 here, Legacy Season 2, is extremely strong. I, I think I like it better than the first one. I do too, but I don't know that I'd recommend you play it unless you played the first one. Yeah. Azul is easily, well, I think... It is, for Gloom, sure. Gloomhaven... Okay. Gloomhaven, Azul is the most voted, Gloomhaven being the second one. Sure, but in realistic numbers sold, Azul was a big deal yes. by far. It's yeah. sold a ton of games. Clans of Caledonia is pretty high for coming from a pretty small company. Mm -hmm. In fact, this, I believe, is still his only game. Anachrony was the first big smash hit for my, well, maybe Tricarion was the year before, but Anachrony oh, got right. a lot of buzz. Right. Lisboa did very well for Eagle Griffin. Too Many Bones. There's a lot of games, by the way, I want to point out here. A lot of these games you're talking about are massive games with tremendous amounts of content. There, there was definitely, that's something that's going on here. Another thing I that thought that's interesting I just was thinking about was like Gloomhaven was his second game that did really well. Uh -huh. And then 
Uh, Anachrony was also the second game that did well. Too many bones. Remember, they did the Hoppelmachas. Mm -hmm. That Hoppelmachas, they had a 10 by 10 booth. That's right. And they were next to At us. Gen Con, and, right? And yeah, and now you come in and you got to walk into their little cave and yeah. be like, oh, I love yeah, your games. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Clank in Space, which was a surprise announcement at uh, Gen Con. Incidentally, so was TI4. Both of those, they That's kept right. secrets. That's right. Dinosaur Island, uh, which got a lot of love as well. Uh, we have uh, Codenames Duet, follow-up to Codenames, continuing that. Big, big hit. Um, the original one was anyway, but Codenames seems to be doing well Codenames anyway. Codenames Duet was interesting because it was one of the first cooperative games for two players that I saw. Specifically, two-player uh, co-op. Yeah, yeah. There's not many of those. I mean, you could play a lot of co-op games as two players, but this was only two players, and it was co-op. Yeah, yeah. Near and Far was a follow-up to Above and Below with a lot more story-driven content in there. Much better balance between the Euro part of it and the reading a story and figuring out what happens. This War of Mine, one of the most depressing games of all time. <laughs> and it actually was one of the first in a... I wouldn't call this a trend yet because we've only seen a few games, but games that are trying to be bigger than the game. Like we're trying to prove a point, tell a story. Oh, sure. You know, yeah, I mentioned, Billy Kerr. Uh, yeah, I mentioned that, I think, a few videos ago with these games trying on serious topics, tackling things that are not just. Yeah, it's still not a huge whatever. trend. No, it's not. It's Sagrada not. was another really big hit. This was kind of a surprise how well this one did. Mm -hmm. The dice placement, the. Glass windows, you know, the, the the stained glass windows, people like that sort of thing. Right, very pretty game. Rajas has been a sleeper hit. It did not make a huge buzz when it first came out, but it's slowly been getting more and more buzz as time still goes by. I feel that way about it now, actually. I've yet to play it, but that's a very high rating, 166. And it's just sort of, it has that steady, slow burn, yeah. Aeon Zen has become, at this point, a bit of a, its own... Uh, much like Azul is a family, Aeon Zan at this point has a little family of games, and they seem to be doing quite well. I have to say, I played it well. and I enjoyed it. I didn't expect it to do that well, right. and it really did. And it was a nice big game for indie boards and cards to have. Mm -hmm. Pulsar 2849, good, great Euro game from CGE. Quest for El Dorado. This was a new deck building thing from Canizia. Mm -hmm. it, it felt different, I think. It did, I think so. It was, uh, a, in my opinion, a bit of a return to form for Knizia. He uh, he has so many designs that a lot of them are repetitive in many ways. But this was one that felt fresh from him, felt new. It was also an award uh, nominee at the very least. I think this might have won, but some awards throughout the year. But, uh, yeah, it's a great game. Very captivating. Probably one of my favorite, if not my favorite, deck-building game, you know. Uh, Charterstone uh, continued the trend of these very hyped games from Stonemaier Games, and in this case, it was a legacy-style game. I, I don't know. How do you think this ultimately did? I mean, it is very highly rated, but what do you think the opinion of the company was uh, for, with between you know the difference between folks coming into Charterstone and folks leaving it? It's interesting. Uh, Charterstone gets a lot of good buzz, but. When I talk to people, I just actually was talking to people at Charleston. They were like, yeah, it was okay. It I like it a lot. You can see that on there. I'm I like it a lot, it. too. But that seems to be the general consensus. And I think it's because the, it, was a ve it was very easy to compare Charterstone to the other Legacy games. Because there are four of them. Yeah. You know, and you, that comparison did not fare well for Charterstone. The other ones are simply more innovative. They're more captivating. They have higher didn't highs. didn't have a strong story. It was a right. good game, though. Mm -hmm. Ethnos is a really interesting one to talk about because at this point, 2017 is the year that Kaman decided that they were going to make 6,000 games. Absolutely. And they were just like, Bleh. Yeah, we went to the convention and it was like 40. They had party games, they had the minis games, of course, but party games and silly games and card games and co-op little games. They had everything. They definitely cooled down in 2018, but 2017 it was there. But of all their games, this one was one I wasn't expecting. The box cover wasn't that cool. The mm -hmm. game itself is not that pretty mm -hmm. and it doesn't look that good. And yet the buzz, just it was such an easy game to play. People really liked it. It is a really, really good game. It's a fantastic design. Um, I think it gets more garbage than it would just because it's published by them. I really do. Yeah, probably, because people were expecting maybe a big miniature battle game, and it wasn't. If this came out from any other company or just about any other company, 
I don't think any of that backlash would have been there. I don't think it's that unattractive, but a lot of people seem to think so. Uh, Century Spice Road, another smash it uh, for Plan B games. We'll talk about that in a bit. Having an ale was the, uh, I feel like maybe the partial return of, um, that's Kiesling game, right? It is, yeah. Kiesling had always been known in the 90s. It was the, He was the second half of Wolfgang Kramer and Kiesling. Yes. And then Kramer went off and did some solo games by himself, and I didn't hear a lot about Kiesling. 2017, he started coming back. For sure. With some so, pretty strong games. Yes. Well, you know, he kind of made a little blip with Vikings. Yeah, but it never got that big of a It never push. did, but it was a good game. It was clever. Folks were going, oh, okay, you know, he can work alone and make something neat. But, yes, and he came back with a vengeance around this time, and he's still doing it, you know. Um, well, I mean, Azul's his, right? Azul is his. Yeah, that's yeah. all you need to design. That's it. You, that's can, it. you can retire on that. That line is his. <laughs> that, is his that is his ticket to ride. Yes. Right? Uh, Mythic Battles Pantheon is a big managers game. You've played this? No, I haven't actually. It looks fun. Uh, it's interesting. This is pretty high on the list for having only 2,182 ratings. Sure. Yeah. But that's because it's a miniatures game. Right. Altiplano was the very hype sequel to Orleans. Did not reach those heights, but people did enjoy it. Mm -hmm. This was a shock. This one, Sherlock Holmes, Consulting Detective, Jack the Ripper, and West End Adventures. The original game, I want to say, came out in 80? 1980? Right. right. This is a 20... Uh, a, a 30 year, almost 40 year later game. Mm -hmm. And it's almost the same game. Yes, right. I mean, it's different cases, obviously, but it's not very different. They even reprinted the older one in the same year. You could get right. both. Right, right, right. Um, yeah. I, I will give credit. I think Shut Up and Sit Down, they did a huge review and talked about how much they loved everything. I think that helped push it. Who knows? Right, right. I remember playing uh, a bit of the uh, first one, I think. And it's just not for me. It's too loosey-goosey and shapeless for me. Baron Park is an excellent game. Um, I see you like it quite a bit as well. Again, it did the whole Tetris shapes. You're building up Tetris shapes. And this was from uh, Phil Walker Harding, who is extremely good at what he does. Take a concept, sometimes original, sometimes not particularly original, but he knows how to condense those parts to their absolute minimum. He knows how to boil that down and give you something that's fun, but extremely easy to get into. And he did it, you know, the previous year uh, with Imhotep and here with Baron Park. Just a great, attractive, easy to get into game. And then The Godfather is an interesting one. The Godfather was sort of uh, blood rage in a mafioso setting. Yeah, but I think The Godfather, Kumini, which was what they were called at the time, or Simon or whatever. Or not, I mean. Yeah, uh, they. I think they were under the impression that this was their white whale. Okay. They made a huge deal. Is that a reference the, to something? White whale? I'm kidding. Keep going. Okay. They they were they were like <laughs> just stopped it dead. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a, you uneducated cur. <laughs> you filthy animal. <laughs> um, no, like they had blood rage and stuff, but that was without an IP. Right. So I think they were like, okay, blood rage was super popular at this point mm -hmm. in time. Here's Eric Lang. Here's the Godfather license. I'm just saying because at the convention that year, they treated it like, ooh, you can see Godfather. This is going to be huge. This is going to be sure, amazing. Sure, and sure. and then it, it did fine. I mean, it is 293. It just no, did it's not highly rated. I think it, it, people like it. I, I personally don't like it as much as Blood Rage, but I liked it. But in 2018, I was finding this at, at every store that's on Earth. That's it. That's it. They, they print it printed too many. too many. That's it. At the end of the day, that's it. This is also kind of the beginning of them trying out, trying to put these licenses on things, wasn't it? I mean, well, they, yeah, they not non-geeky licenses because they did Narcos. I mean, last year or this that's year, true, and they did that. It's like these are like you know movie movies. and TV show licenses that they take and and they redo the artwork. They look great, but it's still an interesting push for them, you know. Uh, and yeah, this was they just made too many. Dice Forge, build your own dice, very popular. Mm -hmm. Santa Maria was a popular Euro game, a port to games coming out to the forefront. Nemo's War, this might have been the beginning of, we were starting to see it a little bit, but in 2017, it almost became like, hey, does your game have solo rules? Sure. I mean, this was a solo game. Yes. Um, but solo was starting to become more of a buzz thing, a very positive one that people wanted in games. Right, right, right. Uh, Sword and Sorcery was a big one, lots of minis and all that. 
Bunny Kingdom was from Richard Garfield again. Mm -hmm. uh, had a, a theme of bunnies, so kind of like, eh, but played it, and it was a solid game. You like it a lot, yeah. Photosynthesis, that's a lot of ratings. It is. Blue Orange at this point was just sitting on top of some, I don't know what. After King Domino, they were, they well, were they just started, getting some good buzz. They, 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 like I said a few videos ago, they kind of went for this family demographic, not just kids, with New York 1901. Right. And the, that was a great, nice, big splash into a new demographic. And they immediately stumbled the next year with Vikings on board, I think it was called. Yeah, unfortunate. That was not, not very a good. good game. You know what? They recovered extremely nicely from well, that. Well, King Domino did not King hurt. King Domino, photosynthesis. And then they followed up King Domino with Queen Domino, which is on uh, oh, this right list. It's at the and bottom. They just, they just really recovered from that. And they now you can look at their games and they, you know, you can tell, like, yeah, this can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a Days of Wonder release or a Plan B kind of the, the look and the feel. It's a gorgeous family game. Downforce came out this year, mm -hmm. this, and you mentioned earlier Indulgence did. This was interesting. Uh, the publisher of this is in our game group, mm -hmm. and he came up to me and said, I'm starting a game company, and I said, uh, you know, I always, I always try to dissuade people from that. And he's like, we're taking old games, and I'm working with Rob Davio to bring them back. And I was like, well, that is a good idea. <laughs> That's a business plan I haven't heard before. Right, right. And so far, it's working pretty well. Downforce yeah. was a clear hit. Uh, it's still, you can still find this one sold in stores, which sounds weird because it's only two years ago, but that's a big deal. Yeah, yeah, it's a fantastic game. Then there's a lot of other games here. We're going to kind of scroll through quickly. The Fox Magic, and the Forest. Magic Maze was a big award getter as well. Lots of attention. Legacy of Dragon Hall was a fantasy flight experiment with a, a book thing. It's got a very cool rating also, or rank. Oh, 1,000, that's right. London, Arcadia Quest, Expansion, Neusfjord. Uh, Rosenberg was not as high as he once was, but Sidereal Confluence is pretty high up considering how weird the game is from WizKids. Right, right, and that's a reprint cover there you see, by the way. Yamatai was uh, the next big, heavy, brutal Catala game published by Days of Wonder. Dragon Castle had some great bits in it. Warhammer Underworld Shadespire is pretty highly ranked considering it's a Warhammer style game in a sense, and those games are not as loved on Board Game Geek for right, sure. This one's very accessible. That's the difference. Sure. It's a, a, a well put together game, uh, gorgeous minis, and extremely accessible. And they've continued that line uh, strongly. Outlive, Ex Libris. Renegade started putting out a lot more games this year than they had in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen Ex Libris, and earlier we saw The Fox in the Forest. Right. Tiny Epic was in full swing with Tiny Epic Quest. My Little Scythe was what I thought was a joke, but was not. <laughs> Although, technically, My Little Scythe is a 2018 game, in my opinion. Sid Meier Civ was rebooted again. That's right. Uh, Feudum was a big Kickstarter game. Five Minute Dungeon, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Wasteland Express Delivery Service was getting a lot of buzz this year. There's another Pandemic game, Z. Yeah, they have Look, the Look, I didn't rate it because I've never played that it. That one is the weakest, I would say. The Rising Tide game. One of the co-designers is a, a heavy Euro game designer. Fog of Love should get some attention here. This was a very unique, different style game. Absolutely. And the guy who put this game out put effort into it that I've never seen before. Mm -hmm. He got this game in Walmart. Right. Of all places. And the production of this game is stellar. This is not something I wrote down for trends, but this is also one of those years where you could start noticing that a lot of games, the deluxe version, quote unquote deluxe version, was like the only version. Yes. The game just felt deluxe. And this, that, Fog of Love, that's one of them. The components are crazy. It's just amazing. Uh, there's a lot. There's a lot of goodies. Tag is probably one that we could talk about uh, based on a. A book, basically. Yeah, or, based on know. a game and a book. They, the right. game's never really described, um, but they said, hey, we want a game that feels like a classic, and the, he pulled it off, yeah. I thought. Yeah, it was an interesting one. Z-Man was also kind of reinventing themselves at this point in time. Majesty for the Realm and Number 9, both from Z-Man games, mm -hmm. is they were still trying to find their way. They had combined with Wind Rider. At this point, yeah, and Wind Rider was very short-lived, wasn't they it? Were essentially, yeah, they were essentially the Euro game division now, or the medium accessible weight Euro game division of Asmodee. Right. Fantasy Flight was handling all the uh, Maritrash stuff. They had the Euro games. Right, right. 
Legends of the Five Rings was reprinted this year. I should mention that, the living card game, bringing back L5R. You also notice a lot more unlock and exit games as we go down through this list. You're seeing some of those. And there's another... Lovecraft stuff still <laughs> kicking. They were now just throwing it into everything. Also, I should mention, we've also scrolled by several Tasty Minstrel games. Tasty Minstrel was not fooling around anymore. Mm -hmm. Putting out a lot, a lot of games. Uh, Riverboat, which was the last Mayfair game, maybe? I don't remember. Merlin from Queen. I'm actually surprised it's only 950, but that one has done pretty well. It's really weird as we get down here, and I'm like, there's only a couple thousand ratings for some of these games. There's just so many games that came out. Right, right, right. And so, Lots of good stuff. Yeah, that's really it. I mean, that's the first page, folks. But, I mean, we could go through and, and just scroll through and look at a ton. But we won't because we don't have time. But there's a lot of great games, and I'm sorry we're not looking at all of them. All right, let's talk about some uh, trends, shall we? I'm going to go ahead and start here with one that was happening around this time. And that is the, the beginnings or the rise of the... You'll never see everything in the box. Dun, dun, dun. Kickstarters. And this was because of Gloomhaven, Seventh Continent, both of which are packed to the absolute brim with content and have expansions. A lot of them, uh, some, of the, some of the time, the expansions come out right on the heels of the game, too. Like the game would deliver, finally, after the Kickstarter. Bam! The, the expansion would be Or you just wide. got it all. You get a box this big, yeah. and it'll be like, well, I don't know when we're going to play all this and stuff. And I think that's what you're talking about when you say, wow, Gloomhaven, look at this box. That's amazing. And then in two years, you're going, oh, boy. This, this is a game sure, I get well, in the mail. Sure, well, if it's the know? only game you're playing, then yeah, it's great. Yeah. If Maybe if it's one of two games you're playing. You get like ten games a year. That's right. harder to get Cool Maven to the table all the time. There's also the fact that you have all these games, miniatures games, whatever it may be, that go to Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. They're not sure how well they're going to do, you know? So they got a game, a couple of things planned, and they do really well, so they add all this extra content. Right. But how well play tested is all that stuff, you know? So you get it, and then you have a core box. You know, expansion one, uh, the uh, crazy hula hoop uh, edition, and then this, and then this box just turns it into a fully co-op game. And right, and it's like how you know. Well, sometimes it's not, and we can tell that because you play a game, you're like, wait a minute, this was this play test, this part of it. Right, right. So that's I think what makes you probably a little apprehensive, me too, about these kinds of games. So yeah, those kinds of kickstarters started to become very popular around this time. I'll piggyback on that and just say, 2017, no one's making fun of Kickstarter anymore. Kickstarter's no. king now. Five of the top ten games were Kickstarter. That's amazing. In fact, amazing. the number one and number four were. And that's discounting the fact that Twilight Imperium was just a reprint of an older game, and sure. so was Gaia Project. So if you take those out of the equation, there's even more. Ten of the top 20 right. are Kickstarter games. A lot of innovation was coming from Kickstarter. No longer could you look at Kickstarter and go, ah, oh, this is a fad. Because there were people that were saying that. If you remember sure. in 2015 and 16, people were saying, all right, well, this Kickstarter, it's a bubble. It will burst. We're almost in 2020, and it's not a bubble. And if it is a bubble, I need it to happen in February. Back our Kickstarter coming up in January. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that was smooth. Uh, that was, mm. We got it through. No one noticed. Mm, yes, yeah, give me, give me some speed. Yeah, All right. Uh, my next pick here is I noticed there were quite a few real-time games this year. It was a quirky game a uh, year anyway. There were a lot of quirky games this year. But one thing that a lot of companies seemed to want to pursue this year was real-time, silly-ish kind of games. So we had Magic Maze which was very well received, got a lot of attention. And there was Five Minute Dungeon, Kitchen Rush. I like Five Minute Dungeon. Meeple Circus also got a lot of attention. Flatline came out this year. Mountains of, uh, uh, Mountains of Madness from Yellow came out this year, where you're trying to be silly, but... Uh, no, I'm doing the, the doing games. I'm, you I'm, are. I'm doing the Panamine section over oh, you here. Are. You That's work good. on your thing. Um, so, What's yeah, next? there were a oh. lot of these real-time games that came out. Some of them more... Silly and quirky than others, but all of them with that time pressure in one element or another. It's not a trend I like personally. I don't tend to enjoy these kinds of games, but they clearly had an appeal, you know. And there had been Escape several years before that was a hit that that did well. 
but it kind of, you know, there weren't that many throughout the years. And then, you know, we had Fuse a couple years before, but this year suddenly everybody had one of these games. And they did well, you know. I think these games are actually still doing pretty well. Again, like I said, it's not for me, but it's out there if you enjoy that time pressure, for me. that energy. <laughs> You know what else, though? In 16 and 15, when As in 15, Asmodee had bought um, uh, Fantasy Flight, or 14 or 15, I forget. And then 16, they bought um, Philosophia, or F2Z Entertainment, mm -hmm. which had on Z-Man games and everything. And everybody was going, Asmodee's buying up the whole industry and worried. Right. Well, 2017 said, guess what? That's not necessarily the case. What's the number one game of the year? Gloomhaven, not owned by Asmodee. Right. And then Seventh Continent, not owned by Asmodee. But one company, and then Kaban was kind of doing their own thing, like, look sure. at us, although, who knows, 2020, maybe they'll get bought. Um, but uh, the, the big surprise here was F2Z Games. Because when they sold their company to Asmodee, I thought, well, okay, that's the end of that company. It was pretty right. interesting because they'd own Z-Man Games. And then they renamed their company to a name which I would never have named a board game company, Plan B. It just, just doesn't sound, it's not a name that inspires confidence. And they're I like, I think it's kind of cool. I mean, it's the idea of like, all right, well, that was Plan A. Let's reboot Plan B. Sure. I like it. I like it. I, I guess. But it, and then they're like, oh, and we also didn't sell everything. We kept pretzel games. And I thought, well, woohoo. Right. But then the Azul Sentry. Combo and flick them up. I mean, yeah, it's true. It was no, a, I mean, like they kept some good stuff. But Azul, I still was mind blown because Azul sold two thousand copies that year at Essen. Right. Which almost no most games are glad when they sell two thousand total. Right. And Azul went on to become the smash hit, the next ticket to ride yes. Carcassonne. There's no denying We're that. always looking for those games, and this is easily in that category. Yes. The third one just came out this year, and there's, uh, I would be super surprised if there's not a fourth one next year. Sure, sure. And to the point where it made Century look like it wasn't that popular of a game, and that one would have been that big. Again, the business sense there, and it was just, to me, it was good. Because I could be like, all right, great. I'm glad Asmodee's, I don't care, I, I'm not as afraid of this Asmodee thing as some people were, mm -hmm. but there were other companies. Right. You would go to a convention, yes, Asmodee still is the biggest company there for sure, but there are other companies and other games and other people are doing things. And Asmodee still is not as big at this point as Hasbro and these other big companies were either. So, right. I don't know, I'm still not worried two years later. No, it's, it's insane about Plan B having... There's not a lot of companies that have one game family that keeps giving, never mind two. Yeah, two is good. <laughs> I mean, like Century and Azul are both a sequence of games, like a family of games, and they're both mega hits. It's insane. All right, I'm going to talk here about um, a company specifically, but also more what they represent, and that is Prospero Hall, uh, which is a conglomerate of design or sort of a design house if you will uh, and they put out this year they had one release listed by date one thing that came out in 2016 it would seem but this was the year that they really arrived and then the next year they did even better so they had Bob Ross which uh, was a fun game as well finished well finalized game and then banned words in the next year they had Villainous they had the choose your own adventure game in 2018 but this is where they began and their games are neat, but they also, like I said, they represent this interesting playing field, which is games that are clearly mass market, but they're not as, for lack of a better term, as kind of dumb as the typical mass market game is, you know? They had a little more. They had a spark. You could tell that designers' personalities and ideas were mixed up in there. You know, this was not made by a... A completely faceless group of people or a company, and they repackaged something and threw it out. This felt curated, you know, and you could find these games at Target. You could find them at Walmart, whatever, right? So that was neat. It was, and it started to elevate the game a little bit for the kinds of things you would eventually find at these stores. Um, it's cool. It's cool. It's cool to see that. It's actually like, at the point now the they've board. changed my mind. If I go to the store and I see a game I never heard of before. At a mass market store, I'm like, well, maybe it's good. Yeah, yeah. I, I used to just assume it was bad on principle. 
That's Prospero the, Hall changed my mind. I think that's the thing. Yeah, yeah, and that's great to see. What else you got? You got uh, one more? Last thing I got is, uh, this is, Z said it last time, but it's even more so. Sequels were still huge. Big time. Queen Domino, near and far to above and far. Clank in space. They made a huge deal about that. Yes. Uh, Pandemic Legacy, season two. TI4, Rum and Bone, second season. There was just this constant, uh, why not? If it worked the first time, it's probably going to work again. And while... You can argue whether these were bigger or worse than the thing. On Kickstarter, sequels rule supreme. Sure. Your first Kickstarter does okay. Your second one, you're like, hey, it's part two. In fact, right around this time, I remember distinctly thinking, it seems like a lot of these smaller companies that are going to Kickstarter, the strategy is kind of finalize your product, kickstart it, Hit whatever goal you were aiming for, just to kind of like, you know, ready the pump, right? Like prime the pump, and then finish it, make it prettier, just so it looks better by comparison to your first attempt, and put it out again, and bam. <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't think that's that's more cynical than I think. Uh, no, but it, like, I don't think it people felt actually... that way. It felt like a lot of companies were doing that one-two punch. The second time you go to the well. They just did extreme, you know, considerably better uh, than the first time. I guess maybe it makes sense that that would be the case, but it was happening consistently. So, no, I agree with you there, you know. The last one for me is a, a fairly minor one, and that is it just seemed like trick-taking games were making a bit of a comeback. There were a lot of trick-taking games this year. Indulgence, which is also from Restoration Games, who published uh, several other games that year, and that was one they reworked and brought back. But also Tournament of Camelot came out this year from WizKids and Trickster Champions of Time, uh, Heroes and Tricks, the Fox and the Forest we talked about, Custom Heroes came out using those transparent cards. Um, there were a lot of them, and I looked through the years to see if I was imagining there being an uptick in the amount of uh, trick-taking games being published. And no, that's right. They definitely, in 2015, there were simply not as many. 2016 had a good amount. Not that many I recognized. 2017 had a good amount, and many of them I recognized, and they kept going. It's still going. I would say it's no longer a brain-dead strategy to publish a trick-taking game. And 10 years ago, it was. You got a trick-taking design, we don't want it. You know, just like maybe 30 years ago, uh, about 30 years ago, it was a bad idea to publish a sci-fi game. It was a bad idea. Yeah, that's really Now it's not. So that, there you go. All right, let's talk about some of our picks of the year. Wow, let's piggyback on that. Indulgence is one of my picks of the year. It was a really fun yeah. game. I had never played the original trick-taking game, and it was done. Big cards. I liked it. Beautiful. Yeah, so that's one of my picks. Nice. Yeah, one of mine is Paper Tales that uh, was ranked. I just saw it about 1,000. 1,003. Yeah. Uh, I really like it. It's a card drafting game. I've always loved uh, drafting. It's got a beautiful look with, you know, the figures look like they're made of paper. And uh, it's a game that does a lot with uh, very little. It seems like, it feels like a small game. It is. But it's very engaging. And it's a little Seven Wonders-ish, but I like it a lot. For me, this was a year on a personal level that I was just head over heels on this escape room stuff. Mm -hmm. I played every exit game, every unlock game, every, right. the, the new, they had a new set for the uh, escape room games, and man, I just was playing all of them. Right. It was so much fun for me. Um, I'm cooling on this a little bit now. Mostly. There's so much. In there's it. so much, and also I'm starting to see some of the same things. Right. I'll be like, oh, well, I need to look at it this way or whatever. You know, it's kind of, you, there's only so many puzzles, I guess, that can exist. But I, at this point, I was still like, wow, this one was better than the last one. You yeah, know, yeah. I was having a lot of fun with those. Uh, I'm going to talk about, um, there's a few here. Yamatai was a neat game. We kind of talked about it. Uh, Rescue Polar Bears was a neat game that came out of Asia that was a, a co-op game with a really cool theme. Uh, but I guess I'll finish with just one more, Link. And Link is a resurgence, maybe not quite a resurgence, but... I doubt a resurgence. Yeah, but. it's not really it, but it was one last hurrah, how about that, uh, for designer Chris Berm in his GIF series of games. And he had come out with these years ago. And there, were, there was a series of games of abstract two-player games, and this was one last one that felt like it took a little bit of what the other ones featured and made a new game from them and I was extremely nervous about it being a bomb actually I remember I'm like oh, I don't know it's been years 
since he made one of these games in this line, he's talking about how he's a very abstract speaker anyway. Uh, he was talking about how, you know, this is inspired by the feel of this and the idea of that. I'm like, I don't know. It's a good game. I really like it. 2017 was a good year for us. We moved into the studio that we're in right now. Mm -hmm. It was also a year that we went through our hopefully last in a long time hurricane. Yeah. Because yeah. I, I thought about that because I'm looking through all these games like, oh, yeah, I played some of these games while the hurricane was Paper, happening. Paper Tales was Paper Tales we played before the hurricane. It was, our, right. it was pre hurricane Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. He read yeah. cool stuff playing games like, all righty, here right. we go. I remember that. So that was, uh, yeah, it was a good year. What about you all? What did you think? Let's see what you guys say about 2017. Uh, this Odd Sonic says 14, 16 were my big years. 17 or is it's interesting it? in the remakes. TF4 for sure, yeah. I know. He said, and Gary said, I have my collections from 14 to 16. I have many expansions from 17. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. how that works, though. You buy games the years you get into it, and then you buy the expansions and kind of expound on your right, thing. Right, right, right. Oh, Jason never won a game of Rescue Polar Bears? Have you? I don't recall if I have one or not. It's definitely challenging, but not. It doesn't feel like uh, you know ghost stories challenging, but it's hard. Scott, you said based on my ratings, 2017 is better than 2012, and that may be true. If I look at them, I would have to do some more comparison. Personally, more, some of my favorite games came out this year, but I just look at 2012 as an important year for gaming in general. Mm -hmm. 2017 is the year Kickstarter came to the top, so mm -hmm. that may be as important as 2012. Right. It's harder to look back at it until we have a few more years under our belts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Arnie here saying there are games on page three that they really like, and for sure there are simply too many to look at. Uh, but yeah, I mean, one of my favorite games is Paper Tales. It's rated a thousand, so it just barely touched it. Looking at, at our pages there, yeah, it's just very. And the closer we get to the present, the more games that rise to the top. Simply, the more games that are published. Really, that's it, right? Uh, it's it's you know rising five. Arnie okay, Paul, is saying, Paul said. He just got in a game in 2017. His friend brought him a Gen Con 50. I forgot Gen Con 50 was in 2017, yeah, and yeah, that yeah. was insane. That I mean, it's still insane, but 50 was probably the peak of insanity. It felt like they were making a big deal about it, which they should. It was cool. But, uh, yeah, that was a neat year for that. Rising 5, as I said. Yes, Pyramid Poker uh, was a neat game from r and &R. I enjoyed that. Yeah, Fog of Love got a lot of buzz. <coughs> You have to adjust for recent hype. Yeah, so everyone, you need to remember that. I think overall, and there's a big disagreement on this, I think games are getting better. Just by virtue of looking back at past design, you know Generally how to Generally speaking, up. sure. Component quality, there's not even a question on that. Mm -hmm. has gotten better. But at the same time, there's also ratings creep of new games. People tend to like new stuff better than old stuff. You haven't sure. played it. So all those things combined yes you're always going to find more new games that are ranked higher than old ones it's just right. the way it is i don't know that's a bad thing though because it unlike movies where if i say citizen kane is a great movie you should watch it z and he can go watch it it's a little trickier if i'm like hey you should play this game star wars queen's gambit and he's like well where is it and like it's on ebay for 300 dollars. right it's a very different thing i guess that's true yeah, I need to play Fox in a Forest. I know, I know. It's on That's my... That's a good one. Yeah, you haven't played that? That is good. I don't know that I have it. Is it in the Dice Tower Library? I don't know. I think my wife would like it. She loves trick-taking games. So I'll loan it to you if you really Alrighty. want to. I will, I will play it if you loan it to me. It's like, I can't. <laughs> it's on eBay for $300. <laughs> Alrighty, well, we better get cranking here. We'll be back on um, Monday with our final part of this, yes, uh, which is 18 and 19 together because we're going to combine them. So come back for that because we'll have to do some interactive stuff with you guys. That's right. We've got a Q&A on Monday morning. And then also I'll be doing another top 10 list on Monday. So lots of things going on Monday. Tuesday and Wednesday you won't see as much from us because of the New Year holiday. Thursday and Friday we'll be back doing top 10 stuff. And then on January 6th, like I said, Kickstarter's coming. And also January 6th, even more exciting. Well, maybe not more exciting, but almost as exciting. The top 100 games of all time. Are you ready? No. <laughs> <laughs> but I will be. I'll give you a game that's not in my top 100. Okay, go ahead. Uh... Photosynthesis, which is weird because I really like it. And it's such a great game, but it just missed. Oh, you're a monster. I know, I know. I'm picking games from 2017. See if there are any more games from 20. Oh, Godfather also fell out. Yeah, yeah. I re again, 
Just because the game's not in the top 100 doesn't mean I don't like it because I've played thousands well, and thousands of games. Well, if you considered it, it's likely in his top 200, so there you go. That's true. There are less than 100 cards here. You just spoil the possible top 101 through 200, fool. Oh, I'm going to do it. Don't worry. <laughs> yes, I figured you are. Anyway, that's going to be it for us, everybody. Make sure you come on back, and we'll see you next week. Thanks for tuning in. Have a great weekend. It's your last weekend of 2019. Woo! I'm Z Garcia. Thank you. I'm Tom Vassell. Party hard. Have fun gaming, y'all. Awesome. Thanks so much for watching another Dice Tower video. If you enjoy our videos, subscribe to the channel for more fun, comprehensive board game coverage. Also, consider joining us at one of our events. Come to Dice Tower Retreat, a small, intimate gathering where gaming is king. Join us for Dice Tower Cruise, the largest board game cruise. Attend Dice Tower West in Las Vegas for gaming fun on the West Coast, or Dice Tower East in Orlando in sunny Florida. Dice Tower Conventions, the friendliest gaming conventions on Earth. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower.